this is the Navigating Adult ADHD podcast, here to help you navigate and thrive with ADHD in adulthood. I'm your host, Zena, and I was diagnosed at age 36. As with many ADHDers, I have a rebellious and non-conformist style. And that means that there will likely be swearing in the coming episode. Please be mindful of any little people. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Navigating Adult ADHD podcast with your host, Zena. I don't know why I said that. I'm sure it says it in the intro anyway, but hey, <laughs> I'm having one of those weeks, my friends. And I wanted to share this with you all before we begin, because this week has been one with a lot of negative emotion. And I am going to do a podcast soon about emotional dysregulation. And that is something that with with ADHD is, you know, part of the deal. We do experience emotional dysregulation. So what that has looked like for me this week is I have experienced a lot of anxiety and just feeling quite low. And there has been nothing to solve for, no specific reason for the anxiety. And it's just been with me for a few days now. And I have really leaned into that without making it a problem that I need to fix, which has been something that I would have done in the past. I've just really allowed it to be there. And what's so fascinating in this and how I I really knew it was simply just emotional dysregulation for a short period of time was something really, really good happened in one of these days. And I was just like, yeah, okay, cool. Like I wasn't excited, I wasn't thrilled about it, but I knew I would get excited about it and be thrilled about it once this passed. And that's like kind of where I'm at now as I'm starting to get to that point of being really excited about this thing. So I just wanted to share that with you all because maybe you're experiencing the same thing. Maybe you're feeling low, maybe you're anxious, maybe you're, you know, experiencing some intense emotions and people are perceiving you as moody. That is something that I've experienced is people are a couple of people have been like, are you okay? Like you're a little up and down, you're a little moody. Like those are a couple of the things that I hear when I experience my emotional dysregulation. So that my friends is a topic for another week, but just, I'm simply sharing it just so that you know, if you're experiencing that too, it's normal. It's part of the ADHD deal. And we're going to talk about it because there are a lot of things we can do to support ourselves and also help to regulate our emotions. Okay. I don't know why I started there, because of course we're talking about something completely different, but relevant at the same time. (laughs) Anyway, we are going to talk about procrastination and how to do it less. So if any of this sounds familiar, I would say let me know, but you can't really on a podcast, can you? (laughs) So do you struggle with getting started? Maybe you avoid things that really need to get done and have challenges with motivation, like especially getting motivated to do things that perhaps you actually want to do, but you just never seem to get around to doing them or or creating that motivation to actually follow through. All of that is so common for us with ADHD, right? So maybe you know that you need to clean the dishes, but you just cannot bring yourself to do it. Or you know that you should really work on that project as that deadline is looming. Or perhaps you just keep telling people you're going to do it. But instead you're just watching another season of Grey's Anatomy. Or you say you're going to start exercising on the Monday. And then Monday becomes Tuesday. Tuesday becomes Wednesday. And then it just becomes next week. Maybe you want to make more money. But you're not actually doing anything to bring that idea to life. That dream to life. One that I experienced uh, last year was I had been saying to people, I'm going to bring, I'm going to create this online course. I've got this idea for this online course and I'm going to bring it to life. And it was on self-confidence. And I coach so many of my clients on self-confidence and I had all of the tools and the concepts that I'd been teaching and I was going to create this online course and I was really excited about it. But, you know, one day rolled into the next and then the next and then I was watching more Grey's Anatomy and Ted Lasso and other things and it just never eventuated. And it was a year later and I realized I was saying to the same person, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to create an online course. And I hadn't even started. Now, when 
this is left unaddressed, it can lead to, you know, feelings of shame and struggles with our self-worth. So many of us simply, you know, thought that we were lazy or that we just didn't have what it takes. And maybe that's how you feel. You think, you know, I'm lazy. I don't have what it takes. I never follow through. I never finish anything. You know, maybe you think that there's like, there's something wrong with you. Those were all things that I used to think. And spoiler alert, sometimes my brain still offers those to me. And sometimes I believe it. Sometimes I still feel that way. Now, we, you know, when we're procrastinating and avoiding things that we know are important and we just can't seem to make ourselves do them, it really can impact the way that we feel about ourselves. Hence, you know, the shame and the challenges with feeling good enough, struggling with our self-worth, okay? However, my friends, our brains would rather procrastinate than take action. When I say our brains, I'm actually referring to all brains. Neurotypical, neurodivergent, all brains. All brains would rather procrastinate than take action. We are literally wired to save energy in case of emergency. I think of that like when I say that, I think of like being in a high school and it like has one of those like break glass in case of emergency, like things on the wall. I think where you like flick the fire alarm or something or there's an axe or something in there, right? Like our brains are like that. They are literally wired to save energy in case of an emergency. Okay, so why is that? It is because our primitive brain, which is one portion of our brain, has evolved from caveman days with three jobs. It has three things that it must do. One is save energy. Two is to seek pleasure. And three is to stay away from pain. Now, those three things are what helped us as a human race (laughs) to survive, to evolve, to get to where we are today. As I'm recording this, the year is 2023. Now, this part of our brain, I was thinking about like an example I can give you. And the best example I've got, my friends, is my cat. And I'm a crazy cat lady. We're going to roll with it. But this part of our brain is so much like my cat, Rocky. Now, he likes to laze around all day long. He will eat. He will make sure that I feed him in the morning, that I give him treats throughout the day, and that I feed him again in the evening. He makes sure of that. He also sleeps in the sun. He will occasionally, if he feels like it, play with some toys or a stick or some other thing he has found. When he feels like it, when he wants to, he'll come in and he'll get a cuddle. He will announce his arrival and demand that I pat him. Right? Now, on the other hand, whilst he's doing what he feels like all day long, not doing a heck of a lot, saving his energy... When he gets a fright, he springs into action, ready to attack or to run. Generally, when he gets a fright, he will freeze. You know how like a cat's like fur stands up on end and their tail like goes like a bottle brush all frizzy? Like he will do that, but he's like, am I going to attack? Am I going to run? What am I going to do? Like he leaps into action. And when his brother, he has a brother called Sugar, when his brother pounces on him, Like sometimes he will hide around the corner and and you'll see Rocky walk out and Sugar will just like dive on him. (laughs) Like he's been waiting there for hours for his moment and he does it. And when his brother pounces on him, he fights back. Like claws are out, teeth are out. Like I'm going to kill you. Like they are forever at the vets because they literally try to kill each other sometimes. But that's his example of the primal brain and how it behaves. Right? It literally is wired for survival, for when it feels threatened to attack, you know, fight, flight, freeze, fawn will kick in, it will go into one of those modes. Otherwise, it's just lying around all day trying to save its energy, doing things that are pleasurable when it feels like it and avoiding pain at all costs, never, you know, exerting too much energy. Okay? Now, 
as I said, that is all how all brains are wired, right? Not just our neurodivergent ADHD brains. But that is the reason why everyone at times will procrastinate. All brains would rather procrastinate when faced with like a task that is, you know, hard, that, you know, we just don't want to do, it isn't immediately pleasurable, we're going to want to procrastinate it, okay? It goes against our primal nature. However, when we add ADHD to the mix (laughs) and our dopamine deficient brains, not only are we already wired to want to procrastinate because of that primitive part of our brain, right? Rather than take action, we are also wired to prioritize and seek out dopamine, right? We want more of the good stuff, the dopamine, right? Now, This is why sometimes we have like no trouble doing certain things. We can really get in the zone with our hyper focus. Okay. And that's because we see that task as rewarding in some way. We're getting dopamine from it. Like sometimes we will spend hours researching the most random thing because we're getting such a huge dopamine hit from it. And we can go down a rabbit hole for hours. We can be incredibly focused sometimes. Now, this is where we differ from neurotypical people big time is because our number one driving factor is seeking out more dopamine. So that means that we don't do tasks in order of importance or social acceptability. We don't really give a shit about that. Right? We do things in order of what we think is going to give us more dopamine, what will be more pleasurable. So how can we procrastinate less? My friends, that is the question. Firstly, I want to say that the goal here is not to eradicate procrastination. That is why I have said in the title of this episode, how to procrastinate less. As long as we remain humans, and I think we're all going to, everyone procrastinates. Everyone does. Now, our goal is to one, do it less using the tools I'm about to give you, and two, also to be a little more compassionate and understanding with ourselves when we do procrastinate, okay? So the first one, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is really based around giving our brain what it wants, which is more dopamine. Okay, so with that in mind, I highly, highly recommend that you listen to the two part series we have here on the podcast about dopamine. I've got part one and part two. We can really understand how dopamine works both for and against us, because with that understanding, we can really be more kind of deliberate in the way in which we use dopamine for us and just be really aware and conscious of how sometimes too much of a good thing becomes a not good thing. Okay, so I definitely recommend after this, you go and listen to that. But in the meantime, William Dodson, MD, I have done a bunch of research on this guy and his, um, let's say, theory and well-researched theory around ADHD. So he is a very well-regarded man in the field of ADHD, and he explains how people with ADHD have brains and nervous systems that follow a different set of rules. Where like neurotypical people will be, you know, do do tasks in order of importance and social acceptability, etc. As I said, we don't really give a shit about that. We have our own set of rules that we follow and that is based on interest, challenge, novelty and urgency. So he has a concept and I have put it in a order that I remember, which is NICU, okay, N-I-C-U. Now, novelty is speaking to our ADHD brain's craving for novelty. So that can be new ways of completing tasks, new ways of approaching problems, or learning new skills and information. So as I said before, when we, you know, learn about something new, I was listening to a podcast the other day. Here's the crazy thing. I can't even remember what it was, but 
the the person on this podcast introduced me to a term or a phrase that I had not heard before and I was fascinated with it and I literally paused the podcast on my walk to google it and screenshot it to remember to look at it when I got home because for me it was such a novelty so then I got home and I went down a rabbit hole I didn't forget it which my brain has a tendency to do hello I didn't forget it I didn't even need the screenshot I went down a rabbit hole googling this don't ask me what it is now because I'm past that but that just goes to show how we are so novelty driven when something is interest. We are very curious. People with ADHD, we are very curious. So if we can add novelty to a task or approach it from an, a, a way of novelty, we are much more likely to be motivated to do it. Okay, so that's number one, novelty. The next one is I. So we've got NICU, novelty. Next one is interest. Now, interest, ADHD brains are readily, readily, that's a funny word, readily able to initiate and maintain focus on tasks that are interesting to them, okay? We already know that when we are interested in something, yeah, we get to it. We, we go and do it. We don't procrastinate it. Now, this is why everyday mundane tasks, on the other hand, can be very difficult for us to engage in, to complete, to even get started, right? But some tasks, when interesting, can result in hyper-focus, okay? So that's our second one. Our third one is challenge. ADHD brains appreciate being challenged. Now, the amount of challenge must be a reasonable amount because when it is too much challenge it can become overwhelming and we can go into like that paralysis mode okay but accomplishing something like challenging or you know having challenge and a challenge element added to a task can give us that much needed boost in dopamine that we're looking for okay I'm going to give you some examples of this in just a minute And the fourth one here in the NICU is urgency. We already know that we function well when there is a sense of urgency. When we have a deadline, we can stay up all night long to get that shit done. This is how I survived school (laughs) and deadlines is everything was getting done at the last minute with exception of anything that I found interesting and a novelty. So to give you an example of this is when I was studying for exams for like English, for example, I did not like English. I would wait until the very last day before the exam and then I would start that day and stay up all night late studying because I didn't, I wasn't interested in it and I, I, it wasn't joyful for me, but the urgency was what got that done. Now, on the other hand, when I was in, uh, what year is it? It's, I'm trying to think, not primary school. When you finish primary school, you go to like, it's called intermediate in New Zealand. And it's around age 12, 13, before you go to what we call college, but I think overseas is high school. Anyway, in that age category, we had a teacher who would give us a assignment every single week and we had to write a report or like give a It was kind of like a, it was meant to be like a two page document and we could draw pictures and have graphs on it and different images. And we had to do a beautiful title and then we had to do like an introduction and present some information and a conclusion. And we got to pick our own subject each week within a set of guidelines and then we got to present on it. Now this to my brain ticked so many of my boxes. It was interesting, it was challenging, it was a novelty, but there was also a deadline. We had a week, it was due every Friday. And that was something I would start early on in the week. I didn't require that last minute deadline because I was already ticking so many of these other boxes. Interesting, right? So if we can, you know, alter our tasks, our activities, our shit that needs to get done, whatever we're procrastinating, and infuse these elements, this NICU, novelty, interest, challenge, and urgency, we can then experience less demand avoidance and increased motivation. Basically, we can procrastinate less by knowing this, that this is how our brain operates and using it. Okay, so infusing our tasks with one or more of these things. 
So here is one way that I have recently done this. I decided I wanted to become more active. So I have worked from home now for a number of years. And although I go for a run a couple times a week, I also go to the gym. I was checking in on my iPhone and it was telling me that I was walking an average of two and a half thousand steps a day. And I was like, shit, that's not very many. I would like to be more active. And so Although I knew it was a good idea to be more active and that, you know, there are plenty of health benefits if you're getting in lots of steps and all of that, like none of that really motivated me. It was like I should, like, yeah, I should do it, but (laughs) that's kind of how I felt about it. So using the NICU framework, I got my partner on board because he is super competitive. Now, What we did was we ordered a couple of those cheap fitness bands. Now, if you have an like an Apple Watch, I know it does this, right? But I don't. I choose not to have an Apple Watch because having ADHD, it's just another distraction for my brain. It doesn't work well for me. So we ordered just a couple of those really basic cheap fitness bands, but good quality ones that measure steps, heart rate, distance, you know, walked, etc. And we decided to set a goal of 10,000 steps per day. And whoever does the most steps over a seven day period, that person is the winner and the other person has to give them a 20 minute massage Sunday night between the hours of five till 8 p.m. All right. All decided ahead of time. Now, our bands didn't actually arrive for a few weeks. They were being shipped out of China, I believe. They were coming from overseas. They didn't arrive here to New Zealand for a few weeks. But I decided, because I was already starting to get the dopamine from this idea, I was like, no, 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 I'm going to start now. So I found this really old band that my partner had. The watch face no longer worked, but it synced to my phone and it still calculated my steps. So I could look at the app on my phone. It would tell me how many steps I was doing. So I started early, way before he did. And I started getting my 10,000 steps a day to get a head start and, you know, like figure out tracks, how long it was going to take all these things. And I made it really interesting. I found new tracks that we have around us that I could walk on. I started walking on different streets, taking different routes and having that element of challenge with my partner on board as well, making it a competition, nailed it. (laughs) So also having the bands and finding, you know, like different little features that they have and playing with them. Like there's a real element of novelty in that as well as like the novelty of like finding different places to walk and like walking different directions and seeing how many steps you can get in different places. And like all of this was such a novelty and a joy to my brain. Then also there's the urgency element of the weekly deadline to basically kick his ass and get my massage. (laughs) So I feel like in doing that, I've, I have been enjoying this, like we've been doing this for a while now. I think our bands arrived maybe two weeks ago. However, like I was already on board well before that. So we've been doing it for a little while and I am still so interested and excited by it and getting such a dopamine hit from it because it's ticking multiple boxes in this NICU arena. So here are some of the ways that my clients are using this framework to give you some other ideas. One of my clients committed to present at a conference, thus creating urgency and the challenge that she needed to get her LinkedIn bio updated and all of her materials actually put together in the presentation, like created in the presentation, plus her LinkedIn bio ready to go so people could connect with her and contact her post-conference. Now, these are things that she had been wanting to do and talking about doing for months because this is an extra avenue of income for her. Now, as soon as she put that deadline in place and committed to that, she started working on it. And another element to that was she actually had someone who had offered to help her with the LinkedIn portion of this. Now that helped her to remove some of the overwhelm because that was part of the reason that she wasn't looking at the LinkedIn and making any progress was that was quite an overwhelming portion with all of the different bits involved. But as soon as she took up this person's offer of help with that deadline, it was done. 
Another client has been wanting to create regular exercise habits. So that's gym visits, walking, healthy eating, those kinds of things. And what she did was she decided to play with a gamification app. And I'm pretty sure it's called Habitica. And so what she did is she downloaded that. I think it was a few dollars. I think it might actually be a monthly subscription, she said. I haven't used it, but I'm sure if it's awesome, we'll we'll talk about it more on, a, on another podcast. But definitely have a look. There's a few of them out there, right? Anyway, she got a gamification app and that really added that novelty element for her brain. Because as she achieves different things, she gets to progress through this game and these different levels. So now she's regularly achieving her daily targets, progressing through her game, and it's so fun. It's giving her brain so much dopamine. Another client who had been wanting to write her book for a while, and she'd been making some progress, What she did to increase the amount that she was writing is she was able to secure a spot at her local library for two evenings a week. Now, this created a real novel environment for her to write in amongst kind of like-minded people. And it also gave her really easy access to an interesting wide variety of research materials for her book, thus creating even more dopamine. All right, friends, my challenge for you this week is to see how this NICU framework is already operating in your life, in your brain with the things that you are getting done and how you can use it to increase your dopamine and get your brain on board with the tasks that you think should get done or need to get done or you keep putting off how can you play with this NICU and I really intentionally use that word play play with it to increase your dopamine okay novelty interest competition and urgency now when we know how our brains work it becomes so much easier to make them work for us. Okay, my friends, that's it for this week. Have a beautiful, beautiful week. I'll speak to you soon. Hey friend, I know exactly what it's like to feel frustrated and confused with your ADHD and to wish that you could better understand what the hell is going on in your brain. And that's exactly why I created my coaching program, Thriving with ADHD. Inside Thriving with ADHD, you learn a step-by-step process to set and finally achieve your goals, to understand yourself and your ADHD. It's where you learn to feel better and manage your emotions and create systems and processes that work for you with your ADHD brain. This is designed for you to learn how to thrive with ADHD so you can create the life that you were meant to live. Visit xenajones.com slash ADHD to learn more and book a consultation.